God's love. Yesterday evening, I had a picture as we were praying in the other room before we started. It was like a whirlpool, a gently swirling whirlpool. Or maybe like a black hole. And that we were all part of that. Revolving around the centre, which is God. God is at the centre and we move around and with him. But that can be scary. You know, that hole in the middle of a whirlpool or a black hole can be fearful. But God says, do not, not to be afraid of closeness with him. We may not understand, we may not comprehend, we may not know what we're going to find, what is coming. But God is love. And we're not to be afraid of that at all just to draw closer because that's what a whirlpool and a black hole does it draws everything closer to itself so it is with God so God's love our inner security and well-being I intend to speak several times about this because it's a big subject (laughs) the love of God the whole of the Bible is about God's love all of it from beginning to end There's some tricky bits in there. But it's all about God's love. God. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he loved us before the creation of the world. He knew you. He loved you. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And this is the key verse. This is the one I really want to focus on today. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We know and rely on, John says, on the love God has for us. This is his will and desire for you. He is the definition, the author and source of love. His love, and he alone, is the firm foundation of and for our inner being, our spirit and soul. There is no other security. Everything else is temporary, everything else is unreliable, but God's love is permanent. We're not to rely on anything else for that inner security. Our inner confidence, our self-worth, our relationship to the outside world, other than that he loves you. Nothing else is internally secure and guaranteed. Certainly not the opinions of others or riches, but God's love. There's a saying you'll hear quite often here. Mary says it most weeks. And that is, God is good. There you go. And here we have, God is love. How often is God love? All the time. And for how long? How long does he love you? From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. His love is from everlasting to everlasting. Nothing gets in the way of God's love for you. Nothing. Nothing stops that. Nothing prevents that. Because he loved you even before the foundation of the world. It's from everlasting to everlasting. That's why we can be secure and rely on God's love. Jesus, in his time on earth, relied on that 
in his inner being. He ministered and moved and walked whatever came to him with an inner security, with, with a peace, with God. Whatever was thrown at him, whatever came to him, because he knew that the Father loved him. Paul wrote in Ephesians, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. It's immeasurable. Immeasurable, that's how great it is. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, to know something that is greater than we can know, almost, he's saying. It's so great. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. It is love greater than we can imagine that gives us fullness. Fullness in God is to know his love and to be filled with his love. That is the fullness of the measure of God because God is love. Everything else flows from that. God is good because God is love. Always. Forever. And his love and knowing his love is the source of inexpressible joy, as Paul puts it. Joy inexpressible flows from that knowledge that the almighty God loves us. And nothing gets in the way of that. So think on it. Meditate on it. Believe it. Receive it. And give thanks for it. That you may be filled with joy. What is his love like? It's expressed throughout the Bible in many different ways. I don't know if you've ever read the Song of Songs. It's not a book that commonly people think of as their favourite. Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. Song of Songs because it's all about love. In this case, on the superficial side, it's about a man's love for his bride and a bride's love for her husband. You are the bride of Christ. This is a love song from God, expressed in passion, expressed in romance, expressed in desire and longing for one another. Because that's how God feels about us, the bride of Christ. That's how God feels about you. His love is passionate. His love is full of longing. His his love is full of desire. That's why we read of such passionate things in the scripture as we go through history. It's because God's love burns like a fire because it is so passionate, so caring, full of longing. God longs for you. Something's gone a bit wrong with the notes here. <laughs> All right. Apart from the Song of Songs, another amazing thing is in the book of the prophet Isaiah, where God is cross and God is angry with his people. But he says to the prophet, he says, take for yourself, a wife of unfaithfulness, an unfaithful wife. Take her as your wife, he says. Because Israel, God's bride, because it was a marriage covenant between God and Israel, that's what it was. He says she's been unfaithful. Frequently. He said, take this woman as your wife as a symbol to Israel of their, her unfaithfulness and adultery. Then a little later, he says, take her back. Take her back as your wife. Having rejected, God rejected her for a while. And he says, take her back 
because so great is his love. That even in that circumstance, even where his wife has been frequently, regularly unfaithful and even had children of adultery, God then says, I still love her. Take her back. Just rebuke her, but take her back and say, don't be unfaithful anymore. This is the greatness of God's love. And back to the beginning, as it said, he gave Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, whatever they are whatever they are. Then the security in God's love gets attacked. This is why I want to establish you in that love, establish you in that security, in that permanence, because it will be attacked. It will be threatened. Right back to in the beginning, God misled Adam and Eve about God's love and then lied to them. So, if you're willing, and this is for your encouragement, believe it or not, and I know you don't like interactive things, I'm not a fan of them myself, but if you can stand up for a moment. <laughs> things that attack our security, attack our knowledge of God's love. Now, a bit of a list here. When you have experienced any three of these lists, I want you to sit down. Okay? Three of the things on this list, just sit down. Fears. Pride, doubts, guilt, criticism, rejection, condemnation, insecurities, temptations, you ever felt a failure? I'm sure I've got you all to stand up again. Have you ever felt weak or inadequate? A lack of self-worth? Now for the millions listening on the internet, there is no body left standing. So it's not just me then. <laughs> and it's not just any of you either. And I hope you actually take encouragement from that because we are all in the same position. So, carry on a little. Low self-esteem and identity. Ever felt useless? Ever felt the urge to give up? Now, without going into details, I will tell you that I've experienced all of these things. So it wouldn't have taken long for me to sit down. None of these things are from God. None of them. They may come from others, either currently or historically. They may be embedded in our inner being from our past. Words or actions that have taken root in our heart. They may come from ourselves. Self-criticism. Or they may come from Satan or other unclean spirits who is always trying to get at you. So what if we fall? James says we all stumble in many ways. A bit like Isaiah, when Jesus was brought the woman caught in adultery, and bearing in mind there's also a man involved. What has he said? He said, where are those who condemn you? They'd all gone. 
when he spoke about sin. Let him who has no sin cast the first stone. He said, where are they? Where are those who condemn you? And she said, there is no one. There are none. They've gone. And Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus does not condemn you. There is no condemnation in Christ for those who believe. No condemnation. These things don't come from God. Therefore, reject them. Paul says in Romans, Romans 8, he said, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? And God has chosen you. It is God who justifies. It is God who justifies, and he is the judge. And he justifies you. So he says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who is the one that condemns? No one is the answer. When it comes to us and God, the answer is no one. Christ died for you. Christ died for your sins. More than that, it says, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are forever interceding for you before God. Always interceding for you. But he doesn't condemn you. Who? Christ Jesus, who died for you? More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for you. No, not him. Jesus does not condemn you. Whatever you've done, whatever you're going through in the past, now, tomorrow, Christ does not condemn you. Who, then, or what, paraphrasing a bit here, who, then, or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? I am convinced, said Paul, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, he says, I'm convinced that nothing will separate you from the love of Christ, the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having cancelled the charge of the legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He goes on to say, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. You can't break a law that doesn't exist. If our country today took away all laws, there would be nothing to break. You can't break them. They're not there. They don't exist. It's important to understand what God has done for you. Once the law was active and we were dead in sins. Now the law is dead nailed to the cross, as he said. Now the law is dead and you are alive. Once the law was active and we were dead, now the law is dead and you are alive in Christ. He nailed it to the cross. Took it away, it's done with. It's an old covenant. Now we are in a new covenant agreement with God a new contract if you like a new marriage with new rules so the law of sin and death can't separate you from his love this is why it says he disarmed the powers and authorities triumphing over them by the cross by forgiveness and removing the law that was their power to attack us he says, now be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the way you think, the way you believe. 
think differently, believe differently. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It's protection against the attacks that come to threaten our faith in God's love for us. The devil is the liar. He's an accuser. So he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth against lies. Truth against lies, buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness against guilt in place. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Peace with God, not enmity. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which is active against doubt and fear. And with which to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation against condemnation. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, both for defence and attack. So you should arm yourself then against these things that attack us, that threaten our constancy, our security and the love of God. And John writes, there are three, three things that re to reassure us. The Old Testament says everything must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. There are three things here. First is the word of the Father, which is utterly reliable. We have the word of the Father as we've just been hearing. Secondly, the Holy Spirit. He said he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we know that we are sons and daughters of God to reassure us in our hearts. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are sons and daughters. The third thing is our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. To so see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what you are. That is what we are. said the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Dear children, let us love with words and speech. Not <laughs> let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in God's presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. I'm going to ask you to stand again. <laughs> and I want you to repeat this three times if you would. And the emphasis is on me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus. I hope that root helps to root it in your heart. Now, I'm convinced, and I'm sure all of you already knows this, but like I said, we get attacked. And nothing can separate me from the love of God. And so, we know and rely on the love God has for us. That is what we rely on. That is where our deep security and confidence comes from. That is where our rock, our foundation, our solidity and constancy comes from. Whatever comes against us, all the attacks, this remains true. This is what we need to be written in our hearts by God. We know and rely on the love God has for us. Not mine for him, 
Not anything anybody else says. Not anything that happens. Paul wrote, when he said, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, there was a whole list of awful things that he mentioned there. Swords, stoning, shipwrecked three times, a whole list of things he mentions. But, it's important to know, like Dave said, God is not a concept or a theory. Paul experienced these things. When he says nothing can separate me from the love of Christ after he lists all these bad things, he experienced all those bad things himself. And yet it's after that he says, I'm convinced that nothing separates me from the love of God. Bad experiences, bad things happening do not separate you from the love of God. They are not from God. They don't separate you from God. So whatever happens, we know and rely on the love God has for us. Thank you. And pray. Father, I pray with Paul that we may all have the power to grasp how long and deep and high and wide is your love for us in Jesus Christ. Enlighten us, Lord. Convict us, convince us by your Holy Spirit in our inner being. Father, I pray you will write these words in our hearts and in our minds. That they may never be erased, that they may never go. That nothing, Lord, can separate me and separate us from your love. So, Father, I thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your reassurance. Thank you for giving us eternal life. In Jesus. Amen.